morning and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. Uh, let's uh, not take our hymnals, but let's all stand as we sing. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. All departed and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Right. Good morning to you. I'm on a time schedule this morning because choir needs to practice at uh, 1015. You've all heard the old story of the, the three boys who were curious about what their, their churches did and why they did it and so on. And, and so uh, uh, there was a Catholic, there was a Jewish, and there was a Protestant uh, boy and they all visited each other's churches, and, and uh, the, the Catholic and the Jewish uh, boys would explain why they were doing stuff and what they were doing and so on. And um, then they went to the Protestant church. I guess it was a Baptist church. And um, they, um, they were explaining everything. And during the, the service, the, the pastor took off his watch and laid it down. And the other two boys said, what does that mean? And the kid said, oh, it means absolutely nothing. Um, so anyway, uh, hopefully it does mean something to me uh, this morning, and we'll get uh, started and get going here. Uh, open your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8. We're studying in the life of Elisha. Uh, we had Elijah first, and now Elisha. Last week we talked about um, four different situations with the sons of the prophets. And uh, this week we're in 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Uh, we're talking about uh, Elisha and the woman of Shuman, the Shumanite lady. Remember her? She uh, was childless and uh, God miraculously gave her a child in her old age. And then the child uh, died. And Elisha uh, came and um, raised that, that son uh, from the dead. And in verse 1 here of uh, chapter 8, Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine house, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word. I pray that you would make it alive and effective in our lives this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Shunammite, let's see, she had a son. Uh, he was young, he died, he was raised back to life, and um, now Elisha comes back to her and says there's going to be a famine in the land. It's going to last for seven years. You need to get out of uh, the area. You need to go to a place where the famine is not. And we say, we see in verse 2 of chapter 8, the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. Where is Philistia? It is directly west of Judah. It's between Judah and the Mediterranean Sea. And so that is where she and her family went. Uh, how much, how many other uh, family members there were, we don't know. 
We do know that when the son was born, obviously she had a husband and um, he was an agricultural type individual because he was involved with the harvest at the time of the death of the son. But um, uh, so we assume that all them went together to the area of Philistia. And it says that in verse eight, or excuse me, verse three, and it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines. And she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and her land. Do you suppose that if you took a seven year vacation, wow, that would be quite a vacation. I don't know if she took a vacation or not. She, she lived uh, during those, those years in uh, Phil, uh, uh, Philistia. Uh, but um, if you were not at your house for seven years, you think somebody else may take up residence there? You think somebody else might uh, come in and say, this is a pretty nice house. I mean, this land here, I think we'll just take it. I mean, these people haven't been here for a long, long time, and uh, we, we'll, just, we'll just help ourselves, and that's what happened. But it says in verse 4 of chapter 8, and the king, let me get caught up here. By the way, let me go back here. The name of this lesson, the title of this lesson is A Light Forever. That's the title of our whole uh, 13 weeks, well, 13 weeks uh, turned into 21 weeks um, of study here, but um, A Light for Forever. We're going to find this morning as we study this one event that is the reason for this whole title of the whole study of the divided kingdom, A Light for Forever, and that's coming up. But in verse 4 of chapter 8, the king talked with Gehazi. Now, who's Gehazi? Well, he is Elisha's servant. He said, wait a minute. He got leprosy. He's not in the picture any longer. True. Absolutely right. Because we're, we're looking in, in the account in, uh, in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings is not necessarily chronological. If we went to Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, that is chronological in the order that it happened. But in Second Kings here, kind of jump back and forth a little bit, and that's what's happening here. So obviously, this happened before uh, Gehazi contracted leprosy and was out of the picture. But in verse 4, the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. Now, who was he talking to? He was talking to the king of Israel, Joram, or Jehoram, the second son of Ahab, king of Israel. You have Ahab king, and then you had his son, Ahaziah, king, um, for one year. And now we have Joram. That's who he's talking with. And it came to pass in verse 5, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life. When did that happen? That's the Shunammite's son. Gehazi is talking to the king and saying, yeah, God has used Elisha in a mighty way. In fact, one time... He restored a young boy back to life from the, from the dead. So he was telling the king this, and behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house. They took my house. They took my land. Now, why the Shunammite woman is coming to the king and not her husband, we're not told. It is possible that her husband somewhere in the ensuing years died. That is possible, but we're simply not told. But she comes to the king and she says, they took my house, they took my land. You need to restore it to me. It's ours. Well, of course, God had divided up the land in Israel between tribes and somebody else took the land. And so we find that um, when she came to the king here in verse 5, it says uh, that she cried unto the king for her land, and Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman 
And this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. Now, why was Joram asking these questions? Tell me all the great things. Simply curiosity. He was not a godly man. He was not one that, that wanted to know the truth. He simply loved a good story. And so this is what was happening here. Um, and the king asked the woman in verse 6, she told him, so the king appointed unto her a certain officer, a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. She got her land back. She got her house back. She got the fruits of the field. How much was that? Probably not much. Remember, they were just coming out of a seven-year famine. But she got it back, and King Joram did that which was right. Something unusual for, his, uh, for himself to do that. But God is moving on. For in verse 7, Elisha came to Damascus. All right, we have God demonstrating his sovereignty over all, and he defends the Shunammite's house. Gives her back her land. She's warned of a coming famine, of course, before that. She sojourned in Philistia for seven years. And now we have, the, she lost the house and property. She petitioned the king for that pro property. It was given back to her. And now it's time for a scene change. Destruction of Ben-Hadad's house. Who's Ben-Hadad? He's the king of Syria. We've talked about him for the last several weeks. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, came down, attacked uh, Israel uh, several times, was, was pushed back. But now, God had pronounced judgment upon King Ben-Hadad. And so Elisha comes to Damascus. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And was told him, saying... The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Hazael, the captain of his army, take a present in thine hand and go meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, shall I recover of this disease? I mean, he's a man of God. He probably knows what's going to happen here. I'm not interested in that which he does or what he says, but I'm talking about my life here. Yeah, go ask him. Take a gift with you. And Hazael did so. Now who's this Hazael? As I said, the captain of his army. Chief, chief servant. But Hazael had ambition. Hazael, we're not told this until later, had had his eye on the kingdom. Oh, what would it be like if Oh, Ben-Hadad's sick. He may not live. Maybe I can take over. Yeah. Oh, we've got to be, be careful about this. Keep this secret here. Oh, well, you want me to go to, um, to uh, Elisha and ask whether you're going to live or not? Well, yeah, we can do that. So what did he take with him? Verse 9. He took 40 camels burden. 40 camels laden down with all kinds of stuff and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Now notice what Elisha says. Elisha says in verse 10, Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. This sickness is not going to kill you. Notice what I said. This sickness is not going to kill you. But then he follows up and says, How be it the Lord has showed me that he shall surely die. This is not contradictory. The sickness will not kill you. Something else will. Remember the ambitions of Hazael. I could become king. What's the quickest way to become king? Get rid of the existing king. No problem. <coughs> uh, 
And so we find King Ben-Hadad is going to die. Hmm. But Elisha confronts him. Elisha confronts him. Okay, there's a map. Elisha goes up there to Damascus, king, uh, capital of Syria. He was down here in Samaria, capital of Israel. You have Phoenicia there. You have, um, can't see it on the map obviously, but down in this area is Philistia, just to the west of, of Judah. So Elisha is going up here to Damascus, the capital, and talking with Hazael here. And he confronts Hazael. Verse 11. And he, Elisha, settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. What does that mean? Elisha, confronting Hazael, just looks at him. I know what you're planning. I know what's going through your mind. You ever try that with anybody? Ever try that with a salesperson? What's your best price? Well, the best price is uh, $29.95. $2,995. And you say nothing. Have you ever tried that? It doesn't always work, but it works sometimes. You just don't kind of look at him, smile, be pleasant. And it's not very long until that salesperson says, well, I mean, you know, we have coupons. That, that'll bring the price down a little bit. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, there's a sale coming up. I mean, you wait, wait. Just, in fact, we can start it right now. Or have you ever tried that tactic with your kids? You know they've done something. Maybe you know exactly what they've done. Just look at them. Pretty soon confessions start coming. I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry I broke it. Okay, thank you. This was the tactic that Elisha was using with Hazael. He settled his countenance steadfastly until he, Hazael, was ashamed. And the man of God wept. Why did Elisha weep? He knew what Hazael was planning. Verse 12, and Hazael said, Why weepest my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. Their young men wilt thou slay with the sword and wilt dash their children in and rip up their, their women with child. And Hazael said, but, but am I a dog? I wouldn't do that. Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah, you would. And you're planning on it. Elisha answered in verse 13, The Lord has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. <gasps> oh, there's the magic words. You're going to be king over Syria. <laughs> I'm, I don't have to plot anymore. I mean, I, well, yeah, he probably did. Because he really didn't believe in what God was doing, what God was saying. But God had spoken. Hazael is going to be the next king of Israel. So they, they part ways. He de departed from Elisha in verse 14 and came to his master who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldst surely recover. He did say that. This disease is not going to kill him. Ben-Hadad probably was greatly relieved and saying, Oh, shoo. Oh, Oh, that was close. Oh, wow, that's great. And Hazael said, yeah, there's something else going to do you in. Something else is. And he had a plan. Verse 15, it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth 
and dipped it in water and spread it on his, Ben-Hadad's face so that he died and Hazael reigned in his stead. Murdered the king of Syria. Suffocated, drowned him. Well, when God says he's going to die, he's going to die. We have the sending of Hazael. And Elisha's message of doom to Ben-Hadad. Elisha's sorrow for Hazael's future actions. Hazael's assassination of Ben-Hadad. God marches on. His sovereignty is preserved. He sovereignly preserves the line of David. We switch scenes in verse 16. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, that's the north, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, in the south, say we're backtracking a little bit, from the last few weeks. Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Joram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Notice it does not say here in verse 16 that Jehoshaphat died. And we look back into history and that didn't happen. Oh yeah, eventually he did die. But for a short period of time, Several years, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven years, Jehoshaphat in Judah and his son Joram or Jehoram, I know, same name, were co kings in Judah. That's what it means. Verse 17 30 and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked. This was his character. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Bad news. As did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. Remember that two or three weeks ago? King Joram in the south had a wife who was the daughter of Ahab in the north. That's a problem. She was not a godly woman. He was not a godly man. They went on in doing exactly what they pleased against God, worshiping uh, Baal, worshiping all, all these idols. But here's the key verse, verse 19. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake. What's the title of the lesson? A light for forever. When did all this start? Joram, the son of Jehoshaphat, rules in Judah. Possibly co-ruler for several years in Judah. We just read about his wickedness. Well, let's skip here. I don't know if you can read that or not, but we're talking about God's promise. Not to Joram, not to Jehoshaphat, not to any of the other kings of Israel except to King David. God had made a promise to King David. Your kingdom shall be forever. For forever. Forever. How long is forever? <laughs> forever. It's still going. No, Israel doesn't have a king that they recognize at this point, presently today. Who's going to be the next king of Israel? Jesus Christ. He's in the line of Judah. He's in David's line. 
or forever. God made this promise to King David when David was alive. Now there's two types of promises that God makes. One is called conditional promise. If you do this, then I will do this. And God makes a, a number of those types of promises throughout scripture. If you do this, then I will do this. That's a conditional promise. This is not a conditional promise. This is an unconditional promise. I'm going to do it no matter what. The Abrahamic promise or uh, the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional promise. The Davidic covenant, the Davidic uh, promise, an unconditional promise. God says, I will do it. And that's what we have here. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah. Did they deserve dest destruction? Absolutely. Have we any evidence, any evidence at all that God has made a, an unconditional promise for our nation? No. You're a prophet of doom. No, I'm just saying God hasn't, hasn't said that. We don't know what our future is. We don't, we don't see anything, anything akin to the United States in the book of the Revelation. Now, maybe God just didn't put it there or whatever, but we don't know. Therefore, we're under the conditional promise of God right now in this country. This is the 5th of July. Yesterday we celebrated the 4th. Seventeen seventy six. Declaration of Independence. What does God say to the United States of America? The exact same thing that he says to every country. If you follow me, if you worship me, then I will preserve you. I'll bless you. I'll give you what you need. But if you turn, that promise doesn't hold. Where are we right now? We don't know. We, we honestly don't know. But we're under a what? Conditional promise. We need to obey. We need to follow. We need to do that which is right. We need to honor the word of God. Hopefully that's what we personally are doing. Is our nation doing that right now? By and large, no. We are living under God's grace right now. We continue. Remember what God has said concerning Judah. I'm not going to destroy it. The family line of David will continue. Oh yeah. The king of, of Judah, Joram, he's going to leave the picture, but he has a son. And the family line will continue. If an enemy came in at this time and killed the whole royal family, the line would have ended. God said that's not going to happen. They're not following me, but I'm going to keep the line going for David's sake. In verse 20, in his days, Joram's days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah. Remember Edom? That area to the southeast of Judah. And said, made a king over themselves. So Joram went over Zair, Zair and all the chariots with him. He rose by night and smote the Edomites which compassed him about. And the captains of the chariots and the people fled to their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. 
We know where Edom is. Where's Libna? It's in the area of the Philistines. Not very far off the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So you have one to the southeast revolting and one to the west revolting. They had problems. It says in verse 23, the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his father in the city of David. And Ahaziah, Ahaziah rules in his stead. So now we have a new king in the south, Ahaziah. He ruled one year. Verse 26, he was 22 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. He walked in verse 27 in the way of the house of Ahab. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and did the, as did the house of Ahab. For he was the son in law of the house of Ahab. Marriage entered in there as well. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab. You know, it's confusing because at the same time, you have Joram king in the north, you have Joram king in the south. Two different people, same name. He went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Hazael, king in Syria, in Ramoth Gilead. <coughs> and the Syrians wounded Joram the king of the north. And so Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah. And when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria, and Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, uh, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was sick. They were in together. They had fought together against Syria the king of the north was injured. He went back to Jezreel to be healed, to, to um, uh, uh, recover from his wounds. So what happens here? Ahaziah's rule in Judah. We talked about his wickedness. In the line of Ahab, king of, of Israel. He had a league with Israel against Syria, Hazael. And God's sovereignty destroyed Ahab's line. We go back to 1 Kings chapter 21. In 1 Kings 21, Elijah, not Elisha, but Elijah says concerning the house of Ahab, it's gone. There's not going to be anything left with it, uh, of it yet. Well, Ahab's out of the picture. Ahab got his judgment. But he yet had family. He yet had, oh yes, the lovely Jezebel was still alive. Where God does not forget. When he says something's going to happen, it is going to happen. And so we find that Ahaziah reigns in Judah. Next chapter, chapter 9. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, remember the sons of the prophets? Elisha goes to one of them and says, got a job for you. Gird up thy loins, take this box of oil, anointing oil, in thy hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there, Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, king, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to the inner chamber and take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Who? Jehu. Jehu. The mad driver. We'll find out about that in a little bit here. I don't know how you drive a, a chariot madly, but he did it. He was known for it. We'll find that out. So the young man did go to Ramoth Gilead. 
Well, he goes in and says, I have, I have a message for thee. You had Hazael there. You had um, others there. You had Jehu there. Excuse me, Hazael was not there. He was at Jezreel recovering of his wounds. But Jehu was there. In verse 7, he meets privately with Jehu. He anoints his head with oil. Verse 6, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Notice, the son of the prophet saying this to Jehu. You ever had a situation where one of your children does something really, really dumb? I mean, really dumb? Who did they learn that from? Probably us. Yeah. But when they do something really, really dumb, I doubt there's anybody in here who would say, ah, that's it. You're no longer my kid. No. They're still your child. Notice what God says concerning disobedient Israel. This is another unconditional promise. God chose Israel. God chose the line of Abraham. He didn't discuss with Abraham saying, uh, you think this might work? I mean, you know, he's, he's just said it. You're my chosen people. It says in verse 6, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord. Disobedient though they were, God says you're still my people. Unconditional promise. And so we find that Jehu is given the, the message in verse 7. You're going to smite the house of Ahab that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. What had Jezebel done in the time of Ahab? She had killed all the prophets she could find. Oh, she didn't find them all. But all that she could find, she got rid of. She killed them. I don't like what you say. I don't like your God. We go back to 1 Kings chapter 21 again, where God said through Elijah, the house of Ahab is going to be obliterated. Just like the house of Jeroboam, and just like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, down in verse 9, God had spoken. So, in verse 11, then Jehu came forth to the servants of, the, of his Lord and said unto him, All is well. Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man in his communication. For the sake of time here this morning, here's our chart of the kings of Israel over here. We have Ahab, Ahaziah, Joram, and there's Jehu. Next in line. Why, why does it start over here with a new list of names? Because the family of Ahab is going to be gone. Nobody left. Jehu takes over. We're up here in Judah right, right now. Ahaziah, king in Judah. So we have the anointing of Jehu in Israel. He assassinates Joram and Ahaziah. Quick to say that. How did it happen? So Jehu, verse 16, 
rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. Who was there? Joram, recovering from his wounds. For Joram lay there, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see him. Remember, they were in league together. Oh man, my, my buddy Joram is, is injured. I, I need to go see him. See, see how he's doing there. Okay? And Jehu comes. Verse 17, there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel. He spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, take a horseman, send to meet them and let him say, is it peace? So the first horseman went in verse 19. He got detained. He got captured somehow. He didn't come back. Verse 19, the second horseman is sent out. Verse 20, and the watchman said, he's still coming. He came even unto them and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. <laughs> he had all the horses in gear. He was driving furiously. God had given him a purpose. You're going to obliterate the house of Ahab. Who is next on the list? Joram. Joram was next on the list. Verse 22, and it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? And Jehu answers him and said, What peace, so long as the wardens of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? God has pro proclaimed judgment upon the whole family, including your mother. Joram turned, verse 23. Oh man, I love this. Joram turned his hands and fled. <laughs> turned his hands, facing now retreating. I'm out of here. And as he was fleeing, he says to his buddy, Ahaziah, there is treachery, O Ahaziah. Oh yeah, there was. Ordained by God. Verse 24, and Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms. How did Joram's dad die? In battle. And the word of God says a soldier drew a bow at a venture. Got one left, can't go home with an arrow, and shot it into the air. Guess where it found its mark? Ahab. Here, Jehu knew his target drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms. Why? He was fleeing. His back was turned in his chariot. And the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot and he died. Where were they at this point? God has a sense of humor. God has a sense of justice. Verse 25, Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. The same man that Ahab had killed to get the land that he wanted that was not rightfully his. They were in the same place when this happens. Cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite, for remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Through Elijah, God said to Ahab, 
your family's dead. All of them. It was happening here. Verse 26, surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the sons of the blood of his sons, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, in this very place where the sin of your dad was committed. Very place. So Joram's out of the picture now. Verse 27, when Isaiah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And, and they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Ibelim. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. Joram is cast into the field of Naboth. Ahaziah d dies at Megiddo. Time for some action here. I know you really can't read that, but Joram, after the battle at Ramoth Gilead, goes to Jezreel to heal. Jehu is sent there. Joram dies. Ahaziah is wounded. He goes on to Megiddo and there dies. God judged the house of Ahab. Oh, not quite done yet. Not quite. But Joram is dead. Verse 30. When Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head or teared her head and looked out at a window. We don't know the age of Jezebel at this point. Probably pretty old. But she thought she was still something. She thought she was just wonderful. And she was going to charm this guy, Jehu. She did what? It says um, she um, painted her face. Now, makeup is not wrong, ladies. I'm not saying that. But the Word of God tells us not to overdo it, right? Well, she overdid it. She overdid it in the custom of the East. Um, you have it in, in Babylon. You have it in Assyria. You have it even in uh, Judah, Israel sometimes. All those areas, when a woman wanted to look alluring, she would paint her face, especially the eyes. Darken the eyes. It was thought to be the ultimate beauty mark. And then put stuff on her head. And she did this. I'm going to charm this guy, Jehu. Yes, indeed. Verse 31, Jehu entered in at the gate. And she said, Hath Zimri peace who slew his master? That goes way back in the line of the kings of Israel. Remember Zimri? Probably not. For he was king in Israel only seven days. That's it. He's the guy who killed the former king and ruled for seven days. And the people of Israel said, what has he done? He killed our king. Let's go get him. And he holds up in a palace and they surround the palace. And he says, I'm not going to give you uh, the, the privilege of killing me. And so he lights the palace on fire and burns to death. <laughs> See, I got the last laugh. Well, he was dead. That's Zimri. Jezebel says, had Zimri peace who slew his master? In other words, she's saying to Jehu, you better watch out. 
You're killing people and you're going to get yours. <laughs> Jehu lifts up his face, verse 32, to the window and said, who is on my side? Who is on my side? Notice who spoke up. And they looked out to him, two or three eunuchs. Probably eunuchs who hated Jezebel. We dare not do anything. I mean, she got power. She's, she's the, the wife of a former king. She's the, the, the mother of the present king. Well, no, he's dead, okay. Um, Jehu says to these eunuchs, verse 33, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trod her underfoot. came out, came in and did eat and drink and said, go see how this curse, uh, now this cursed woman and bury her for she's the, a king's daughter. Remember who Jezebel's dad was? He was a king up in Phoenicia, the center of Baal worship. That's where it came from. She's the daughter of a king. She deserves a decent burial. They went out and looked for Jezebel. Verse 36. <laughs> Remember 1 Kings 21? In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. In the carcass of Jezebel, what was left? Verse 35. They went to bury her. But they found no more of her than a skull, and the feet, and the palms of her hands. God had spoken. Jezebel was dead. God said that she, well, her, her blood will be spattered on the wall of Jezreel. And it was so. Years later. Does God mean what he says? He fulfills, Jehu fulfills the judgment on Jezebel. Jezebel's presentation, she got all beautified. It didn't work. She died and was consumed by the dogs. Because God, through the mouth of Elijah said the dog shall eat her. Judgment was passed. She was consumed. What can we take from this lesson today? What God says he's going to do. Remember, we're living under God's conditional promise today. If you do this, if you obey, then I will bless. We're not under an unconditional promise as far as a nation is concerned. How are we doing? How can we be better? Only by God's grace, not by our own methods not by our own works, only by God's grace. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word. Teach us, allow us to do that which is right. Help us to be truly your servants. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.